So, Dr. Hein, I'll turn the table over to you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, this year, it's, it, Aggie, isn't this the most number of participants in this meeting ever? Yes? Did you say uh, 230? Because when we first, first started planning, we were saying two, uh, 125, 130, something like that. It's really remarkable. So congratulations. It's great. Um, I uh, have the honor of uh, hosting a, a, a short session here on the surgical aspects of pancreatic cancer. Um, we all, as uh, Dr. Weinberg described, work together as a team. And we have some of our uh, central team members here, really core members, Lauren D'Amato and Stephanie, who are both uh, nurse practitioners. Uh, they are the linchpin for the entire pancreas program at UCLA. So just wanted to recognize them. Um, I'm gonna start by giving a little bit of background on where we've come uh, in the world of surgery for the pancreas. Uh, I'm really sort of talking about the antiquities. And then we have two new, fresh, freshly trained, experts in pancreatic surgery are going to give you a, a, a more a forward-thinking approach to how we're addressing surgery and pancreatic cancer. Um, and uh, uh, it's going to be a nice session, and you'll be able to see uh, sort of the whole arc of where things have come from the very beginning. So traditionally, the, this Whipple operation that many of you all have heard of, not everybody here had a Whipple operation. Some people had different types of pancreatic surgery, a distal pancreatectomy or a partial pancreatectomy. But traditionally, this operation has always been thought to be the most difficult of operations. It's the big gastrointestinal operation, and uh, the outcomes were not great. Uh, up to the, say, 1970s, uh, very high mortality rates, one in four patients died uh, if they went to the opera room and had this operation, high complication rate. And then if the patient survived, it wasn't such a great life afterwards. And really, for such a long time, the five-year survival for patients who had surgery for pancreatic cancer was really quite dismal. Just to give a little bit of anatomy uh, of where the pancreas is, uh, if I can find our pointer. Here we are. So this is the back of the stomach. Kind of stomach is flipped up here. This is the duodenum the head of the pancreas, the body and tail, the pancreas, here's the spleen, the kidney sitting back behind. And when we do a Whipple operation, this is what we take out. So here's the head and what we call the ensign of the pancreas, the first part of the intestine of the duodenum. And then we also take out the gallbladder and make new, three new connections so that the pancreas, the bile duct, and the stomach can empty normally. So we do some replumbing. And this is an interoperative uh, video of that. I, I'm not sure we're gonna go through all of it, but you can see that this is a traditional Whipple operation where we've made a large incision, which is usually in the middle going up and down. Um, and uh, right now what we're doing is we're sewing the pancreas, uh, which is, get up, I'll back up, I just wanna show you. This right here is the cut edge of the pancreas. This little is a stent in the pancreatic duct, and this is the intestine that we're gonna be sewing the pancreas to. So, very invasive, uh, a lot of things happening. Um, uh, you know, the, vis the visualization is really only from the top above, um, and so it's, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's a tricky operation, as I said, uh, but these days, patients do pretty well. The first Whipple operation was actually done in 1898 by a man who's not named Whipple. Okay, this is Alessandra Codavilla, and he was a, a professor in Bologna, Italy. The patient died 24 days after the operation from widespread disease, and it was the only time he ever did a Whipple operation. So this is actually the father of the Whipple operation. Uh, the, uh, uh, the re operation really came into modern times in the early 1900s by Walter Kasch, who was in Berlin did the first successful pancreatic duodenectomy, and then Whipple 
kind of uh, popularized this uh, in the 1935s. He, he, in the 1930s, he did the procedure in two stages where the tumor would be removed and then the patient would go back later and have the reconstruction done. And so from the 1930s until up to the 1960s, uh, Whipper operations, uh, very high mortality, not a lot of them done. Um, and it was controversial as to whether or not we should be doing it or not. In fact, if you had a mortality like that, with a survival like that that I said, there was a lot of discussion of whether we should be even doing this operation because the outcomes were pretty bad for pancreatic cancer anyway, and weren't we just making it worse by taking them to the operating room? And for the first time, uh, 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 a gentleman, uh, John Howard, who is at Indiana University, reported 41 consecutive Whipples without an operative death. Um, and this is really a big, a big thing. Uh, subsequently, extended to 72 resections, and with overall uh, uh, mortality was really very low. And this was the very beginning of when Whipples began to become safe. And so today, mortality for this operation is less than a percentage point at places that do a lot of them. So. Pancreatic surgery is safer for a variety of reasons. First off, we have much better imaging. We can see things better on a CT scan. Imagine in the 1980s, when we really didn't have CT scans making decisions on whether or not the patient should go to the operating room. Operations are safer. We have better techniques with perioperative management and working with anesthesia. We have standards in which we follow patients after the operation. And if a patient does have a complication, our colleagues in interventional radiology can put a catheter into areas and drain things in very creative and amazing ways that improve our outcomes for the patients. And over the last 15 years, these operations have begun to consolidate at large volume centers, a little bit less in California. And it's because we have a very complex health network in the state of California. We have a very large, the Kaiser system has 40% of the lives in the state of California. We have a lot of other large systems. We have a big state and a lot of people. Um, so this, our, our, our state is a little bit different, but in the rest of the country, it has really consolidated so that small hospitals are not doing these operations anymore. But in the state of California, still over half of the pancreatic surgery is done at hospitals that do only one or two of those a year. Um, there was a lot of work done here at UCLA by the first chair of surgery, uh, William Longmire, in this field. He was an expert surgeon, became an international figure, and is a, sort of a, a modern uh, uh, godfather of, of surgery in the U.S. and really across the world. He passed away in 2003, but he popularized this concept of a pylorus preserving procedure where the whole stomach is preserved. The idea was you have better nutritional outcome if you left all the stomach in place. And we didn't need to really resect all the stomach because there was no oncologic reason to do it, meaning we, didn't, we weren't leaving cancer behind if we didn't take uh, the tumor uh, out. And so it was here, uh, Bill Traverso and, and Bill Longmire, who popularized the pylorus preserving uh, Whipple operation. So that's part of our legacy at UCLA. Dr. Reber uh, came along in the 1980s, late 1980s to UCLA, and just so you will know, Dr. Reber is one of a few gods of pancreatic surgery in the world right now. There's maybe four or five of them around the world, and he is one of those. So we're very lucky to have him here and to have really developed the program here. It's, this is his legacy, uh, the program at UCLA. He did a lot of work in this field. Uh, Dr. Reber is an extraordinary surgeon. Always as part of his personality and his surgical acumen, he does not like red blood cells being lost. I remember that as a resident. Uh, that was very important to him and in fact he was one of the first in the in the world to really demonstrate that if you lose less blood during the operation and the patient doesn't get a blood transfusion the actual survivorship of the patient is better so better surgery improves outcomes not just around the time of surgery but long term and how long the patient is going to live 
Uh, this is some of those survival curves that show that, uh, you know, the patients that lost a lot more blood did worse over a five-year period. But look at this. This is the UCLA experience. Um, and patients who went to the operating room for pancreatic adenocarcinoma, this was reported about 10 years ago, survivorships of approaching 40%. Remember I talked about in the beginning, it was 5%. So iteratively, as we go along, there's improvements in outcomes for patients. Here's an example of a, a patient who's had a complication. I talked about interventional radiology. This is a big fluid collection underneath the liver. And the radiologist put a little pigtail drain in there. The fluid collection's gone. The leakage stops and the patient gets better. This is some information about consolidation of volumes at high volume centers. Not only is it important to have surgeons who do a lot of them, but to be in a hospital where a lot of that is done because it's a whole team approach. If I uh, or any of our surgeons here today who do a lot of these types of operations went to a community hospital in the San Fernando Valley, we would not have the same outcomes as if we did them in Reagan here because just the people on around, the thought process, the group think, that's going on is not here. Um, so uh, that's the details of what pancreatic surgery used to be. Still a little bit is. We do a lot of these operations open. But what we wanted to do is talk to you today about advances in surgical technique um, and the idea of using robotics to do pancreatic surgery.